China's military says it will continue conducting large-scale drills near Taiwan. This comes just one day after Beijing announced its live fire exercises that put Taiwan on alert for more than four days. And that has ended. Taiwan is accusing China of using these drills as a test run for a possible invasion. For more on this, let's bring in CBS News foreign policy and national security contributor H.R. McMaster. He also served as the national security advisor in the Trump administration from 2017 to 2018. Uh, happy Monday to you, General. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you, Vlad. Good to see you, Emery. So what's your take on China's show of force? I mean, this is not uncommon. Uh, this is something that they do regularly. But does it have any significance at this point in time? Well, you know, it's uncommon in terms of the scale, right? So it's a massive exercise. And, and what they've done is foreshadowed their plans, really, and their capability and their capacity to maybe blockade Taiwan, to put a chokehold on Taiwan, the way that Russia's tried to put a chokehold on Ukraine, by the way, uh, with, you know, with the blockade on the Black Sea, uh, for example. And so I, I think it's very significant for a number of reasons. One of them is, you know, I think that when, when you, you see in the next big mobilization, of People's Liberation Army uh, 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 operations. Uh, will we know if it's another exercise or will it be maybe the, the precursor to a real invasion? So I think it's also an effort to kind of desensitize us and the Taiwanese uh, to what could be the preparations for, for an actual invasion. Now, Nancy Pelosi was not the first American official to go to mm -hmm. Taiwan, and she even sort of made a comment about how, hey, they didn't get this reaction when the men went to Taiwan. Uh, but, you know, times are different. And so I want to ask mm -hmm. you, do you think the House, the Speaker of the House, should have gone to Taiwan right now? And are you concerned that this may set a precedent? Maybe concern isn't the right word, but does this set a precedent for other future speakers or other American politicians to sort of prove that they could stand up to China? And will they then be required to go to Taiwan? Well, you know, I think we have to put the blame for all this, all this tension on the Chinese Communist Party, right? Because it, it, it's clear that there was an understanding uh, of the of the, the one China policy included that Taiwan could, would not be subsumed by 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 the People's Liberation Army uh, by by the uh, by the People's Republic of China by force, and you know this, this the speaker once it was leaked that she was going, I think she had to go. Mm. Otherwise, it would have been just succumbing to the to the intimidation uh, of the of the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese Communist Party. Now that all that said, would it have been better maybe? to first build up Taiwan's defensive capabilities, deliver on some of the arms purchases and the other capabilities that Taiwan is integrating into their defense to make them indigestible uh, to, to, the, to the People's Republic of China, and then maybe do these sort of high, pro, high profile visits. Yeah, I think the sequencing might be a bit off. You know, the old saying from Teddy Roosevelt, Roosevelt you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need a little bit more of that uh, and, and a little bit less performance Mm. Uh, and, and a little bit more, you know, actual progress in, in helping Taiwan and, and others develop the defense capabilities to deter China. Because China's becoming much more aggressive. And Marie, I think what's changed really more than anything is China's behavior. And if you read some of the speeches that Xi Jinping has been making, it sounds to me like he's preparing the Chinese people for war. And, and, uh, and, and I think we're in a very dangerous situation uh, and and uh, and I think what he's looking for are signs of weakness. And I think now what we have to do is is show strength. When when, when I mean we, I mean we, especially Taiwan, uh, but then also Japan, Australia, other allies and partners across the region. Because the, China's aggression is not limited to to Taiwan. Look at what he's doing in the South China Sea. He's trying to own the ocean in the South China Sea, the area through which one third of the world's surface trade flows. He's been bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier, ramming and sinking Vietnamese vessels, mobilizing this maritime militia, repainting People's Liberation Army Navy vessels in Coast Guard colors, which I think is probably a precursor to maybe even more aggression in the South China Sea. So I think we're entering a dangerous time, uh, especially after the Chinese Communist Party Congress in October to November of this year. And so, General, there, there's no real way to contain China. I mean, they're a nuclear power, uh, and the United States is a nuclear power. But can you envision a situation like what we had in the 1950s, 60s, up until uh, the 1980s, 
with the former Soviet Union, a, a situation where, you know, we all remember when we were kids, General, you're probably serving, um, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, um, which is something that was sort of drilled into our, I mean, by our teachers, um, about this notion that, yes, we are in a dangerous climate in the 70s and 80s, but we don't want to destroy each other in the world. So that notion would keep these superpowers from doing just that. Are there similarities here, or do you think that it could actually go pear-shaped? Well, I mean, there, there are similarities, uh, but, but I think what you're, you have to recognize is just as we were dealing with the Soviet Union uh, in, in the Cold War, there's, there's a very important ideological dimension to this competition. We tend to think, oh, you know, it's not logical for Xi Jinping to have a zero COVID policy and shut down his economy. It's not logical for Xi Jinping to crack down on his tech sector and kill the economic growth that he needs to, to get the Chinese people out of the income, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the middle income trap, you know, and, and be able to, uh, uh, to generate domestic, uh, domestic demand and re reach his economic goals. You know, it's not, it's not logical for him to, to engage in these threats you know, against Taiwan from our perspective. But we, we tend to, I think, undervalue the ideology and emotion that drives and constrains the other in this, in this competition with an authoritarian power, with a dictator who is determined to extend and tighten his exclusive grip on power. What Xi Jinping is motivated by is, are really emotions of fear and ambition. Fear of, of losing the party's exclusive grip on power and an ambition to, in his view, restore China uh, to, to its rightful status in the world. This is the, the campaign of national rejuvenation and Xi Jinping's words to take center stage in the world. And so for, for us to compete effectively with China, we have to galvanize, I think, the free world to compete economically and, and, and informationally and diplomatically uh, and militarily. And then also we have to deter China. We have to help convince Xi Jinping that he can't accomplish his objectives through the use of force. Listen, before we let you go, I just want to ask you about something a little different, not China and Taiwan. You were uh, mentioned in a book that uh, there was a bit of an excerpt, excerpt written about it in The New Yorker. The book is called The Divider, <laughs> Trump and the White House. And this is the quote that I want to get your reaction to. Uh, the so-called axis of adults was over. None of them had done nearly as much to restrain Trump as the president's critics thought they should have. But all of them, Kelly, Mattis, Dunford, plus H.R. McMaster, the national security advisor, and Rex Tillerson, Trump's first secretary of state, had served as guardrails in one way or another. Trump hoped to replace them with more malleable figures. What's your take on that description of what things were like in the White House at that time? Well, I think, Emory, this is kind of a misframing of the role of, for in, in my case, a national security advisor and, or a secretary of state or secretary of defense. You know, I don't think the American people don't want members of, a, of an administration to be guardrails for the elected president. They should be trying to help the elected president accomplish his or her agenda. The guardrails for the president are the American people, ultimately, but especially their representatives in Congress and the judiciary, especially if the president were, was to do something illegal, right? Or, or to, uh, and you see that process playing out uh, now, uh, and you saw you saw it playing out during the Trump administration and the and the after the lies about you know a stolen election and the judicial process and the the, the legislature doing the right thing. I mean, the the Senate Majority Leader at the time, McConnell, and the Vice President doing the right thing on January sixth. So I, I think what's 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 uh, unfortunate about this, and, and I read the essay just, uh, just, this, just this morning, mm -hmm. is we should never accept that you want members, unelected members of an administration to be guardrails, or God forbid, you know, the military to have any role uh, in, in controlling you know, the, the commander in chief, because really our founders established these separation of powers because they had learned from the bloody wars in England in, in the 17th century. They had learned from Oliver Cromwell. And, and our, what we have to do now, I think, is strengthen and fortify our institutions, and especially, Emory, our confidence in them. I see members of both parties, not at the level of, of January 6th, but members of both parties who are undermining the American people's confidence 
in our democratic institutions and processes and elections. All this talk before you know the midterm elections about whether or not they're going to be legitimate. I mean, uh, this, this is contributing, I think, to to a reduction of confidence in, in our democracy. And this is a real danger. And and I think that we need both political parties, especially now, to, to, to take some responsibility to make sure that the military stays out of this discussion. The military is not partisan. The military is, is a wonderful institution in which you can serve your country, defend your country, and defend the institutions that sadly too many of our, our politicians are, are undermining. Uh, and yet, General, can I just ask you, though, um, on that note, uh, the, the book uh, and the excerpt written by uh, Susan Glaser and Peter Baker does say that, and this is quoting the book and quoting the article, that uh, General Mattis, as the chief of staff, uh, tried to explain to the president that I understand the point about not being a guardrail. You are all former, you and Mattis and some of the others were, you know, former members of, of our armed forces. But... Uh, you don't want uh, uh, Matt is saying to, um, Kelly saying to the president, you don't want yes men, right? You don't want to be surrounded by yes men. And the president, Absolutely. according to the book, saying, yes, I do. I do want yes men. And so my question yeah. then, General, is you know, and I learned this back when I was in my first ROTC class, which is that it doesn't matter if you're a, a cadet or if you are a general in armed forces, you are compelled to uh, not follow orders that are illegal, even if it comes from somebody right. who outranks you. And so in that That's way, right. you, yes, you don't want the military to serve as a guardrail for the commander in chief. On the other hand, somebody who only wants to surround himself with people who say yes to everything, even if it is morally, ethically, or even Ill illegal, we don't want that either in a democracy. Uh, absolutely. So uh, you, you raise a couple of really important points. By the way, I wrote a book about this called Dereliction of Duty, which was about uh, the Johnson administration and the decisions that led to an American war in Vietnam. And one of the lessons, uh, I think, of, of that history is that Lyndon Johnson got the advice he wanted. And the people around him were all too happy to give him the advice he wanted. So I think it's your duty. It's always your duty as, as a military advisor, as a civilian advisor, to give the president, the commander in chief, best advice. That's what I decided to do, Vlad. I mean, you know, I got used up in the process. That's why, you know, that's why I only lasted 13 months. But it would have been a disservice to Donald Trump and a disservice to the country to tell him to tell him what he, what he wanted to hear. And and so I, and, and uh, the second point that you make is is important as well. Nobody is obligated to follow an illegal order. And again, this gets back to the checks. And, and, and balances, you know, what is the body that, that determines the legality of, of an order? Well, it's the body of law created by our Congress, and it's, it's, and it's, it's the, our judiciary who can rule on whether or not an action is, is legal. And so this is why it's so important to have people of character in senior positions, including the president. And you have to have people who take their oath seriously, right? I mean, I took an oath Vlad, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same, right? <laughs> and, and to obey the orders, but the legal orders of, of my commander in chief, right? And so, uh, according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the oath we all take mm -hmm. and we believe. And what's unique about our democracy is we don't take an oath to a king, mm -hmm. we don't take an oath to a national leader, we take an oath to the Constitution of the United States. And, and I think that that's part of the nobility of our, of our democracy. It's part of the nobility of our military profession and our professional military ethic. So this is why I object to this idea that, you know, the, the, you know, the, that the axis of adults were guardrails, or especially that the military are guardrails. That's actually a danger to our democracy, right? I mean, we, you know, we, we want the guardrails to be our constitution, the separation of powers. And that's why we really, I think, have to do everything we can to, you know, to, to strengthen confidence in our institutions and strengthen those institutions themselves. Hmm. Uh, General H.R. McMaster, thank you very much. Thanks, Emery. Thanks, Vlad.